delighted to have uh, with me an excellent panel to discuss that uh, question of our times, best of frenemies, media and platforms. Uh, there's so much to think about in, the, in this field at the moment. I think those of us uh, who either study this or work in newsrooms know that the relationship between Google, Facebook now, TikTok, Apple, uh, agile platform of choice has been uh, both uh, fraught, sometimes beneficial, often adversarial, uh, but it's reaching a new phase. Uh, so we thought it would be a really good idea to have a broad ranging discussion about that, and particularly one that takes in the regionality and how different this is. We so often have these conversations just about American publishers and platforms, and it's really a very different uh, view from the rest of the world. So I'm delighted to have with us a great panel. I'm going to ask them to just introduce themselves when they when they introduce the topic in their region, uh, because otherwise we'll be here all day with my um, uh, introductions. But to my immediate left, there's uh, Christoph Platt, from, uh, who's the director of the media program Sub-Saharan Africa for KAS. Uh, next to him is Paula Miraglia. Hopefully I've got that right, Paula. Thank you. Um, who is the CEO and co-founder of Nexo Journal and uh, Gamma Revista in Brazil. Next to her, we have the founding uh, editor-in-chief of the wonderful uh, newsroom, The Markup, uh, Julia Angwin. Uh, and then next to her, we have my sometimes co-teacher, director of the media technology democracy program at SEPA uh, over the road at our School of International and Public Affairs, Anya Schifrin. Um, so I just wanted to kick off with everyone on the panel, first of all, taking three different um, regional perspectives on this, and then coming to Anya at the end to talk about the overall, uh, the changes in the international um, regulatory frameworks. So I'm actually going to kick off with Paola, if that's okay. Uh, so Paola, do you want to tell us a bit about, first of all, your business and what your relationship with the platforms are and then how you see this in uh, Brazil and uh, Latin America. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Emily. And uh, good afternoon. And thank you for the IPI for inviting me to talk about a topic that it's really important for Brazil, but also important to the platforms. Brazil is one of their biggest markets. So this is a, uh, is a, a topic that is being very much discussed in our country and our region. I'll take 30 seconds to talk about Nexo. Nexo is a digital, independent digital only uh, news startup that was founded in 2015. And I must tell you that, uh, well, Brazil has a very traditional concentrated media ecosystem with legacy media that has, uh, everyone has more than 100 years old and not a lot of tradition for new entrants, particularly new entrants for profit. So we have a very diverse and vibrant ecosystem with not-for-profits, but not small, medium sizes, uh, newsrooms for profits. When we launched, I must say that the platforms were really important for us to get known. I think that the distribution, and it, it's important to acknowledge that. It was crucial, I think, that for an initiative as Nexo to be known. However, today I must say that the conversation is completely different and much more complex, and this is what I would like to address in this short introduction. I would like to start by saying that uh, platforms are shaping uh, the media ecosystem, they are shaping the industry, and I think I can say about Brazil, but I think we could say that for the world in general, and in different ways. I also think that platforms are, good, are a good name for us to address th this big, this, the whole, um, of the different platforms, but I also think they are very different in relationship to news organizations. The first way they are shaping is misinformation. I won't talk very much about that because it has been addressed in different, but I just want to give you three examples. So Facebook keeps saying that they will keep uh, false information published in their platform. They will flag it, they will reduce distribution, but they won't put it down. I ask you how we should feel about that. Journalists, scientists, citizens, especially in a country like Brazil where we had 600,000 people killed in a pandemic also because of misinformation. We should be offended. We cannot listen to that and think it's okay to hear something like that. There was an example two weeks ago, Google, if you searched in Google feminism, what is feminism in Brazil? You would see a Google ad. The first result would be a Google ad. 
that was sponsored by a right-wing uh, organization. So what are we supposed to do? Pay to be well-placed in search to provide good information. And finally, there was a long piece uh, in at PLE in Brazil showing how YouTube became an important misinformation platform, particularly in the case of a radio, where people, um, they talk about opinion as it was news. And it's very hard to distinguish when it's opinion, when it's news. So I won't talk very much about that, but I think misinformation, as you know, is a key element. There's another one I would say is dis distribution and reach. And I'm sorry I'm talking fast because I just want to say everything that I want to say. But um, distribution and reach is another key element here. Our major traffic today comes from Google, so you can imagine how powerful Google has become uh, for a player like us. Uh, we launched a publication, a new publication two years ago to which Facebook is irrelevant, so there is a difference here, it's important. But how does search works? How does cover works? We don't know. So it's something that is very important for our business, but we don't know how it works. Uh, Google has something called Core Web Vitals, I don't know if you're familiar with. It, it, it's a way to rate the performance of your website. And who decides what's a good performance? Google does. And if you don't perform well, you don't perform well on search. Yeah, so you have your reach compromised as well. Uh, so, and we recently had a drastic change of algorithm in, uh, uh, that Google promoted more than once that has impacted our audience dramatically. So reach is also defined by platforms. Publishers payment, uh, both Google and Facebook have a pro, they are paying publishers in Brazil, but not all of them. So we don't know the amounts, we don't know um, what is the criteria, but we know that lacks transparency and can create a lot of imbalance within an, an industry that is already very imbalanced. So to discuss this is also crucial. And finally, regulation, and I will end up there, I promise. So Brazil has suspended, uh, it was supposed to vote uh, legislation regarding big tech regulation, and it was suspended last year. And it was a victory for Facebook, for Google, but for also for Bolsonaro, our current president. And my question is, does uh, Google and Facebook want to be side by side with Bolsonaro? I think that we need to discuss that because it was a victory for all of them. Uh, Next year, we'll have two new candidates who said that we will approach this. I will just finish by saying, I think that we cannot have impeccable, we, we need to have impeccable legislation, but it needs to address also how uh, the industry will flourish. I, it can, we cannot have legislation that will impact players like us or reinforce a even more concentrated legislation. We need a coalition of civil society, media, researchers, but. Uh, a strategy that responds to democracy and not a business model. So thank you very much. That's very good. You did indeed talk very quickly, so it's, <laughs> that's okay. Um, which means that you, 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 you finished well within time. So I just wanted to ask one very, very quick uh, follow-up question to that, which is, um, is this a subject which is broadly discussed within Brazilian media? So is this, I can see that you're it's very important to your organization, but is this something which you'd say is high on the agenda of publishers? Thank, thank you for asking me that, Emily, because it was here and I couldn't <laughs> <laughs> talk about that. But I think this is one uh, and um, is, another, is a key element. I think that journalists need to be aware of what is at stake. Also from a business perspective, I think that we focus on misinformation and this is key, it's super important. But media organizations are at stake because of this, and journalists need to know that. They don't necessarily have the mandate to debate with the platforms, their bosses do. And I've been in meetings where journalists were uncomfortable uh, with a more confrontational approach, but they can put pressure on their bosses, and I think this is essential. So I think there must be awareness of the risks we are running here. Thanks very much indeed, Paula. Christoph, can I come, come to you and ask, first of all, about uh, KAS's work and also about what your view of this um, landscape is uh, in Africa? Thank you very much, um, Emily. Um, I have been a journalist for almost 30 years, amongst them for uh, nine years as a correspondent in East Africa in the 1990s, <clears throat> which was before the advent of social media, as we all know. And I saw the power of independent media that we had 
uh, in many, many countries where multi-party democracy was being demanded and human rights abuses were accused. Talking about social networks, we, we do that in the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung's media program quite often with the publishers that we work together with. We are regional programs, we organize conferences for editors-in-chief, but also for people from, from government who are dealing with information and, and technology control. And we talk about the credibility crisis, uh, the relationship with the social networks, we talk about business models and other issues. When we talk about the networks, I think one has to differentiate between the network's relationship with African public, however generalizing that might sound, with African government and with African media. African public in its majority, of course, like many of us in other parts of the world, embrace the arrival of the networks. Whoever has tried to make a telephone call uh, from Nairobi to Kampala in the 1990s knows how difficult it was to make a telephone call on these copper wires which were always stolen and, 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 and then resold on the black market. And now the market tender somewhere in Kisumu at Lake Victoria, she can use WhatsApp and she can use and she can compare the prices for the mangoes that she sells with the prices in the next village or in the next town. Is it too expensive? And is it, uh, should, I, should I offer a better rate? And all that. People can all of a sudden communicate. And the public has embraced the possibilities that the networks have provided, also in creating digital jobs. Fantastic. In very repressive countries, we had the opportunity to see the emancipating effect of social networks. Interestingly enough, in democratic, more democratically orientated countries, we saw that and we still see the negative effects um, of the social networks. Because hate speech, for example, is a big issue. And that's where we come to uh, the network's relationship with the public, particularly the relationship of Facebook or Meta with the public. They treat the African continent as a big lab. Their algorithms, according to Francis Horgan, whom we spoke to a couple of weeks ago, don't really seem to adapt to African languages in which you f find racial, uh, racist or anti-Semitic or sexist uh, remarks. So the, the artificial intelligence actually doesn't detect it. Anybody or some of you might have read a story in Time magazine a couple of weeks ago about the moderating facility that Facebook had assigned in Nairobi in Kenya where 200 uh, exploited people who speak 12 different African languages are supposed to monitor uh, violent content, which of course doesn't help on a continent with half a billion, no, a quarter of a billion users of Facebook products and <coughs> with a lot of racial, ethnic and religious tensions uh, on the continent. The relationship of the networks with the governments is pretty cozy. Mark Zuckerberg likes it to visit Paul Kagame or Mohammed Buhari in Nigeria and to underline the importance of Facebook. Buhari and others uh, sometimes have their fallouts with Twitter because they don't like the kind of tweets that they see there and then they ban Twitter and then half of Nigeria downloads VPNs and still uses Twitter. And when journalists and the critical uh, public or uh, civil society is trying to address these networks with their complaints, saying, listen, we have experienced Rwanda. We don't want anything like that to happen again in North Nigeria, for example. And you have to assist there. They continuously complain about having no access, about maybe being received or um, being able to launch a complaint, but then they hear nothing. So media and civil society is coming to a point in many African countries where they say, we are tired of Google scholarships and Facebook workshops and conferences in posh hotels where we launch our complaints and at the end of the day we go home and nothing changes. No algorithm changes. 
the dangers are still there, the hate speech is not being banned. What can one do against it? A couple of years ago, before the pandemic, we did a conference in, in Addis Ababa and there were some legal representatives from Ethiopia there who said, well, in Germany, you now have the network enforcement law that act, at least uh, forced the networks to speak to you. We are Ethiopia, we don't have any power. But there are 100 million consumers. And that is a power that even Facebook at some stage will listen to. I was in Brussels and Berlin last week with a group of fact checkers from Senegal, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Nigeria and Ghana. And they were surprised to hear that many of the media houses in Germany and in Belgium and of the fact checkers in Germany and Belgium, they don't have a privileged access to the networks themselves. So they said, well, we always thought that you Europeans or the Americans have a privileged access, but it doesn't seem to be the case, only where there is a legal threat against those networks. So I think the answer for the African continent is to work stronger with parliaments, to work on finally approving the Malabo Declaration, which was created, I, I don't know, 12 years ago or so, and is still waiting for uh, more African, uh, to, be, to be signed by more African countries. But we also have to realize the fact that on the African continent, the only currency that you can pay with as the market woman in Kisumu or as the student in Johannesburg is your data. So the discussions that we are having here in, Euro in Europe about data protection and privacy protection and all that are luxury, <coughs> excuse me, luxury debates that the majority of Africa cannot afford. Thank you. Thanks very much, Christoph. I'm sure we're going to come back to so several of those. Nobody has um, blown, I suppose, the, the, the klaxon of alarm on this story uh, for longer or louder uh, in the United States than you, Julia. Um, it's, you've, you were ahead of this story uh, a long time before um, many others here, and you built a newsroom around the idea that we should try and do journalism completely independently of these systems and interrogate them. So give us your perspective uh, from the United States about how, how that's going. Great, thank you. Um, it's great to be here. Um, and uh, I, you know, am a technology native. I grew up in Silicon Valley and the, um, learned to program in fifth grade. And I was really, I was pretty sold on the tech industry. You know, I was actually going to go into um, Silicon Valley and work there, but I fell in, in love with journalism along the way. And so I think it allowed me to see both the evolution of journalism and the evolution of Silicon Valley alongside each other. And what I saw was that uh, the tech industry, um, which I had great hopes for, um, that I thought it was gonna empower people and lift up democracy and all of the things that we all thought. And it's not entirely untrue, right? Like some of those things have happened, right? Like it is actually easier to shop, comparison shop for airline fares than it used to be. <laughs> and I appreciate that. Um, but a lot of things happened that we didn't foresee. And I think the thing that really surprised me was how directly the problems of the tech companies um, impacted my own profession of journalism, right? So. The reality is that journalism in the United States was funded by the fact that the companies, the news outlets, local news outlets or national had basically a monopoly on their audience. And so when I worked for 14 years at the Wall Street Journal, the reason we had so much money and we could hire so many reporters and do investigations and foreign correspondents was because the only way you could reach the middle aged guy with a BMW who golfed on the weekends, who was a middle manager at IBM, was through spending hundreds of thousands of dollars for an ad in the Wall Street Journal. Now, if you want to find that guy online, it costs you a fraction of a penny. And that's because of the surveillance advertising system that these tech companies came up with, which was basically following everyone around and building profiles and dossiers. And what that did was completely took away any reason to buy ads in any news outlet. And so, you know, news um, ad revenues are down to $10 billion from, I think, 20, 10 years ago. 
20 years ago. Um, and online ad revenues are what, almost 200 billion, right? So uh, the money is gone. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been taken. And it, it's not that journalism has never faced problems of distribution before, right? So journalists always had to get their, your magazine or your newspaper into the newsstand, right? But the newsstand wasn't a global empire that had $200 billion of revenue and controlled not just your news outlet, but literally anything. Any news, imagine the local newsstand could they decided whether any newsletter could be published, any blog post could be published. Literally every single bit of speech is controlled by these companies. And that is a situation that is impossible for basically any business to negotiate with, but certainly for a business that is big, cr cratering, it's extremely difficult. There's, it's just a complete disparity in power. And so journalists, in terms of distributing their content, as you said, it's incredibly important for startups to do that. And yet, at the same time, it is the only way right now. Because the, the equivalent in journalism was you had your, like I was a local news delivery person. I rode my bike and distributed papers around. And, and the equivalent now is email, right? But you know what's interesting? You can't actually deliver your email into a news into people's inboxes unless Gmail decides. Their algorithm decides whether you're spam or promotions or not. And so there's actually no direct route anymore for journalists to get their news out there. And I realized I didn't answer your question about my own personal career, which is, as a journalist, I worked at the Wall Street Journal, ProPublica, and then I founded The Markup a couple years ago in order to really focus on writing about big tech. And we are not actually as independent as I think, Emily, you sort of implied, in the sense that, like, obviously, we have to promote our work on all sorts of social media platforms, right? But the one thing we have done is removed any sort of surveillance tracking technology from the website so that readers are not being tracked when they come to the markup. And that's a privacy promise that's fairly unique, I think, us and Wikipedia make. <laughs> and that, that point about true independence, I mean, it seems from everything that everybody has said here so far is that one thing is true worldwide, which is there isn't really, it's a fantasy to think that you can be an independent news outlet of and distribute your material directly through, you know, even directly through your app, you're on an iPhone or an Android or whatever. So this, that, the, the fact of the dependency, how, now we know that that is the case. We've stopped having the argument about, could we live without the platforms? Um, and we don't really sort of see a, an independent future. Uh, I was just wondering, Julia, if you're more optimistic or less optimistic than you were, say, five years ago about journalism getting a fair deal, about platforms aligning behind perhaps press freedom um, standards. <laughs> uh, do, do you, you know, how do you see the direction of travel? Well, I have one, f I have a flaw as a person, which I tend to be optimistic despite all evidence to the contrary. <laughs> so you have to just <laughs> bake that into my answer. But I have to say I've been really amazed to see um, five years ago when I said, look, all this surveillance advertising um, is bad uh, and is going to hurt journalism. People just said to me like, shut up, what's wrong? I love my, you know, getting the right shoes marketed to me online. <laughs> And now people really see it, right? And so I think the awareness that this actually is hurting journalism and the, the reality that journalism is the watchdog of democracy and we're seeing democracies fail, and in part we're seeing that because of a lack of journalism watchdogs. So that has come together much more than I ever expected and people are trying to remedy it, right? And it is impressive, right? So in Europe, they put in rules and they're considering more rules and they're considering funding journalism more. There's more efforts out there to bolster journalism and to see if there's a way to transfer some of the revenue from these companies that have, you know, I would say probably excess profits and, and put those more towards the public interest. And there's all sorts of challenges with all of those schemes, which I will let on your <laughs> detail, but I am more optimistic than I expected to be at this point. That's great. Optimism. Um, Anya, in, I'm going to hand over to you now to crush the optimism or possibly build on <laughs> no, it. I don't no, know. my motto is if you teach, you have to focus on solutions. You don't, you know, it's just not fair to students to be depressing. Um, so you've teed out very nicely for me, so thank you. Um, 
power. Uh, Emily and I have long been interested in the Australian news media bargaining code. Uh, we started writing about it actually in fall of 2020. And that's just one example of governments deciding they need to do something about the power imbalance. So I think this absolute realism that these platforms are huge, that often regulation is really just a nudge. And so what happened in Australia, I just got back, I was there for three weeks in July talking to people about how the bargaining code is doing. And it was a very sort of pragmatic Australian view of the world where the Greens, the Conservatives, everybody got together and said, let's extract revenue from the platforms. Um, and the way they did this was Rod Sims, the competition chair, pointed out there's a huge power imbalance between the media outlets and the big platforms. So what we're going to do is tell Google and Facebook they need to negotiate with the outlets and pay them for the news that they use. That, and if they can't agree, then the government will, will come in as an arbitrator. So it's a very clever thing. It left it to the market, but with the government as a last resort. And um, around the world, we've seen a huge disagreement between large outlets and small outlets, where small outlets have often tried to block government support of journalism because they don't want it to disproportionately go to the large outlets. And there was a lot of worry in Australia that this would really be um, a gift to the Murdochs. And in the end, again, the green support was pivotal. Um, and the net result has actually been very good for journalism. 200 million do Australian dollars, by some estimates, have been given to journalists, journalism outlets this year and last year. They're hiring like mad, as I was saying in the other panel. All the journalism professors I spoke to said their students are getting jobs. And the Mindaru Foundation actually got lawyers to help the smaller outlets collectively bargain. So at this point, Google has given money to nearly all the outlets in the country, from what I understand. Meta has not. So the government may now, they're doing a review of the law. Their report should have been, will be finished in the next few weeks and then made public. Um, and they may do what's called designating, which is forcing Facebook. So that, to me, was an example of how government can step in and help. They can't solve everything. And I want to talk more about all these other things. Emily, you don't know this yet, but our next project is going to be a conference in March to bring regulators together here at Columbia with academics and civil society. I'm hoping we can get uh, Christoph involved in that, actually, and Paula, too. Um, but that's I only come to these conferences to find out about, out about my next project, so that's... <laughs> Thank you. But that sounds a good one. I I'm signing like up. It. That's why no, I figured no, I'd indeed. just bring it on you here. Um, Courtney, of course, has got a new report coming out very soon on, on some of these efforts to get the platforms to pay for news. But I think that one of the points I wanted to make for our international friends is that the U.S. is an outlier. We've been paralyzed. We haven't been able to regulate. We've got all these bills stuck in Congress. The rest of the world is taking action. Some things we wouldn't like, you know, the, the fake news laws in many countries, but also, as Julia pointed out, out some interesting things in Europe. And I think maybe my last point is journalists have to be at the table. You know, that whole thing we used to hear, 2016, I got so sick of it. You know, we don't want the platforms to regulate. We don't want government to regulate. That's over. It's happening. Ship is sailing. Let's get on it. And um, the IPI has actually done some very important work in, in this area and provided some good guidelines. That's great. Thanks very much indeed. I'm going to come to, um, to uh, the audience for questions uh, in a second, so you can sort of have some top of mind. But I just wanted to go back to, uh, just again, sort of, it feel, still feels like a very asynchronous world. So to Christoph's point that, you know, actually, you know, in Africa you have um, populations and communities that are in no way privileged in the same way that American outlets or European outlets are. As journalists, what is it, you know, we, we've been talking a lot at this conference, the IPI is a great force for good in the world of how we do network journalism. Um, is there something we should be doing more collectively from a global perspective as journalists? You talk about being at the table, uh, Anya, that helps, you know, Christoph, what would you like uh, to see help even up the playing field a little bit? Is that a, a pipe dream? Is that possible? I think, first of all, media has to be self-critical in their dealings with the networks. Um, and that applies to media in Europe, the US, and in Africa. We embraced the networks in the beginning. We thought this was super. 
We didn't care much about revenue. We thought this is a revolution. Same thing in Africa. Now the big fear of the publishers that we deal with in Ethiopia, in Nigeria, and in the DRC, and in many places is that they are totally unhappy. They are also totally unhappy with those African members on all kinds of advisory boards of Google and Facebook and so on. Because if you ask those members on those advisory boards, how many are you? What say do you have? Are you just being used as camouflage? They don't get a proper answer. And, but the big fear is, if they don't sit at the table, they might, don't ha they, they might not have a say. They are fearing that they are losing out. And I think the big support that can come for, um, for the African continent, for civil societies, is to encourage civil society to push their governments for national legislation and then for eventually signing this aforementioned Malabo Declaration, because that's the only language that the networks accept. Inviting them and getting them to the table, okay. But like those fact checkers that I traveled with that I mentioned earlier on, they said, all these fancy Facebook offices in Bryanston and Johannesburg with beautiful conference rooms with well-sounding names like Timbuktu and Chongololo, it's all pretty useless. And I think the legal aspect and the legal work of these civil societies and media organizations has to be encouraged. Mm -hmm. And there we can join hands. Right. We were talking earlier actually about the Brazilian legislation that you say was actually killed uh, last year, both by publishers and by Bolsonaro, who you would not think of as being natural allies in this. But that, but you were saying that you think that there is again sort of that, that really you you have the phrase regulation. That is where we are going to end up. So is, is that your sort of belief as well about um, what's going to happen in Brazil? And yeah, both well, both uh, candidates, both Bolsonaro and Lula, have already uh, said that this is going to be a, a main issue for them. So I think there is no way out. We're going to be discussing regulation, and I think that here is, I mean, thinking about the IPI and everything that was said here, I think that international exchange and cooperation is key. What Anya was saying about the Australian leg legislation, for instance. We, we need to understand what's going on around the world. I think there, the discussion is going on in Turkey, in Brazil, in Australia. And I think we, we need to be informed and we need the society to be literate on the topic. I remember when I was watching uh, one of, uh, when Mark Zuckerberg went to the Congress here in the US, one thing that shocked me was how little the congressman knew how things worked. The questions they made, it was like, you, you, you need to be better prepared if you're going to sit with these guys. So I think we, we need to have better literacy in general. Uh, and I'm not talking only about, I think, of course, we're discussing journalism, but there is an influence in many other areas, education, health, so people cannot be afraid of platforms. And we need to, I mean, we, par we are part of Google Showcase. So we receive money from Google. And as we were talking earlier, I don't see any, uh, we're not getting divorced from Google. There is no way out. So we need to talk to them. But my feeling is that we need to have a plan because so far we have been reacting to a situation that has been posed to us. So we need to have clarity about what's your plan. And in the case of regulation, I think there's a lot of nuance because not necessarily because it's good to the platforms, is bad to the platforms is good for us. So I think it's a discussion that it's more complex than that. I mean, that point about, uh, and again, I'll sort of be interested in everybody on the panel's view on this. So just to play devil's advocate for a moment, which is, um, first of all, Google and Facebook had gave more money, certainly to local news outlets in America during the pandemic than any other granting foundation by a long way you know they are the major funders if you like of innovation and local news outlets from a philanthropic point of view again by a long way this is not a sort of marginal thing so are we really saying that it would be better to intervene with regulation and why would it you know why is it why is the distribution of funding the kind of build it the the nation building between publishers and and platforms not working uh because i think there are lots of publishers who would say 
oh, but it is working. Certainly the publishers who have been lobbying in the United States to say we don't want any of this type of regulation, right? So there is a, there is a kind of a, you know, there's consensus on this panel, but I'm not sure that there's complete consensus kind of out there. Tell me I'm wrong, Julia. Um, <laughs> well, I guess I would say that I think um, it's, it's difficult, right? Because like you said, there are a lot of newsrooms really struggling. And so money helps. <laughs> and so you, you kind of just have to take whatever money you can get. But I think it really matters what are the conditions around that money. And I think the government can make that easier. Because getting a grant from Google and hiring four people and then being worried that you might have to fire them next year if Google doesn't renew means you are not going to do anti-Google stories. Like, that's just. I, I'm just going to say that <laughs> as a fact, <laughs> okay? I don't, no impugnment to any person, but like that is just a reality. But if it's something that like the money is contractually set up through some system, like the Australian thing, where it's like dealt with by the business side and it's not sort of contingent on your coverage, then perhaps, perhaps it's cleaner, right? All money is going to influence you somehow, but I think it really matters how you do it, right? I'm, I admire like the sovereign funds in Europe that just distribute money in a hands-off way from the government to journalistic outlets. And I also have to say, like journalists in the US have been very um, weird about not wanting government money, but being completely fine with taking corporate money. And I think that is a strange, particularly un American mindset because almost every newsroom takes money from Google, Facebook, or, or some other company, right? And I, I think that sometimes we overstate our ability to be independent then when, to, it's particularly because I have a nonprofit newsroom, right? Nonprofit, you're very much worried about your next year's funding, you know? And the interesting thing about the for-profit model was it actually put more distance, right? You weren't, um, worried about which person was buying an ad so much. I mean, sometimes people would pull their ads because they were mad about the coverage, but these, these grants are much more personal, that kind mm -hmm. of funding. And so I think there needs to be a structure to make that not right. discretionary. Right, and there's also a different relationship, right? So platforms can often be in the heart of a newsroom in a way that no other kind of financial support <laughs> would be. You know, they're talking to your editors, they're offering you tools, they have a seat at the table, and it's not always a Newsrooms would not always characterize it as a bad thing, but it's certainly something that changes the relationship, I think. I um, just wanted to follow a couple no. things Julia said. One, of course, is just the reminder, your public service announcement, that they don't pay enough taxes. So let's not forget that. And, um, you know, in an ideal world, they'd be paying taxes. We'd all be living in, you know, Denmark or Sweden. We'd have a nice government fund. Um, but the other thing I want to say, Julia, is that when I was writing my report for Conrad Adenauer called Saving Journalism, one of the things I noticed was that that attitude of we don't want government help is pervasive. And it's really interesting because so many Latin Americans, so many African journalists, when I said, hey, Indonesia is giving tax credits to outlets during the pandemic, said, oh, we don't want a tax credit because that might mean there's a list and we don't want the government to make a list. And I thought, okay, you're taking money from Ford, from Soros, from DFID, from USAID, from Gates, from Google, from Facebook. You don't want your own elected government to even consider giving you a tax credit. So I did find that very inconsistent. And you looked like you wanted to do something so I'll no no, no. I was going I was just I was gonna make sure that we had enough time for questions so if people have questions um, do we have a microphone in the audience please say yes so I don't have to run off the uh, stage or you can take one of ours actually so if anyone has a question put their hands up no questions sir. oh yes over there and so can we start over there and then work our way over here thanks Sorry, it's a, it's a feature of Columbia Journalism School that we always have one less microphone than we need. And it's, it's kind of meant to be, you know, it's like problem solving for academics and students. Sorry. Uh, look, thanks very much. And thanks very much for all those interventions. I thought they were all very interesting. Uh, as the... Uh, oh, sorry, could you just say who you are? Uh, for my, name's, uh, my name's Chris Warren. I work for Crikey Media uh, in Australia. Uh, Hurrah, we love Crikey Media. <laughs> Um, and I've actually been the journalist who's written most about the, uh, the news bargaining code agreement in Australia. And I, I have to say, I'm not sure that the outcome is as rosy as you were led to believe. 
part of the problem is it's in everyone's interest, the platforms, the large media corporations, the government, to pretend that it actually is a great outcome. But actually it is about $200 million a year. Half of that's gone to News Corp. Most of the rest has gone to the other two major uh, uh, private, large traditional private media. Uh, and all of it just about has gone straight to the profits uh, of those companies and hasn't resulted in the employment of uh, any additional journalists. The only additional journalist that's employed is the money that's gone to uh, not-for-profit or uh, media like The Guardian in Australia or for um, the money that's gone to the public broadcaster, the, the ABC. So it's actually been, in many ways, an enormous disappointment uh, and I would encourage people who want to pick it up to totally rethink it and make sure it's being paid in a way that guarantees the payment of journalists, not the bottom line of uh, our resident billionaires. Um, sure, yes, if it, I was going to say, and back to the, but the, and just a declaration of interest, I'm a board member at The Guardian, so I can endorse well, first some of, all, of what Well, can we have a big Chris round says. of applause for Cranky yes. for everything that they've been doing with Murdoch lately? I think you should have a panel just to talk about that. It's the whole world is watching. Um, yes, I'm so glad you've made all those points. And Emily and I have been working with Taylor Owen, who of course is looking at this in Canada. We've been talking to other countries. And clearly, there's many, many improvements that need to be made, and hopefully Canada will make them. Um, are we being recorded? Oh, okay. Well, what the hell? I'll say it anyway. Um, uh, Courtney and I have been trying to get hold of people in the Indian government who are looking at this. And um, I was asked to have a phone call with someone in the Indian government who's been talking about this um, law in India. And then I thought, actually, I don't really want to talk to them because I know what they are going to do when they get that money. Um, so I think that it's an example of, yes, these laws need to be improved and no, I mean, this is to Christoph's point, they're not going to work everywhere and I think different, we'd love to have some sort of universal standard that everybody can follow, but I think the fact is a lot of these laws just cannot be universally applied. But anyway, s chapeau to Crikey. <laughs> yeah, so, oh, yes, you so, yeah. Hi, thanks to all the speakers. I'm Sewell Chan from the Texas Tribune. Uh, this week, the US, U.S. Senate Committee uh, took up the markup of the Journalism Competition and Protection Act. As I understand it, one Democratic sil senator's illness meant that the committee was unable to move forward um, and there were some you know, uh, amendments that, that were not seen as desirable. I am struck that some local news publishers like Lion have said that they do not support the legislation because they fear that um, the money that would come from letting news publishers negotiate with Google and Facebook might simply go into the pockets of hedge funds and private equity funds. Um, Anya and Julia especially, but, but really any of you, do you have thoughts on what the right policy uh, path is going forward? Well, it's interesting. Steve Waldman, I mean, everybody here who cares about this really should get on Steve Waldman's mailing list. Everything I know about the subject comes from Steve, but we were literally over the weekend trying to see about dr something I know nothing about. I'm not a lawyer, but how you can draft it. And there may be people in the room who know. I mean, Steve and I were, say, were sort of discussing, can you just put in a clause saying this money can't go to publisher salaries or can't go to stock buybacks? And um, yeah. Yeah. Isn't it very straightforward? I mean, if we take money as a university from a foundation, I'm sure the same is true with so the Tre Texas Tribune, you actually have to have a ledger of pretty tight accountability about where, where it was spent, like down to the last dollar amount. I literally don't understand why it is not possible to put something like that as a requirement of that, if, if you're going down JCPA route. So in other words. That's what we were talking about. Right. I mean, as economists say, funds are fungible. Right. Um, but yeah, can sure. you design cost it? Is we it different get, if we it's We have a, a whole panel on cost allocation. Sorry, yes, Power. Oh, sorry. Power actually yeah. knows what she's talking about. She's CEO <laughs> and is trained for this. So it's. Now, I think there's also another layer there that is, and, and coming back to Australia, was that when you have a declining industry in a specific country, this kind of money could save players that are not committed to innovation, that has 
uh, 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 counted with money coming from uh, coming from advertisement has benefited from tradition of for the fact that they are there they have been there for a hundred years and they're declining and all of a sudden they're going to be saved by the money coming from the platform so i think there is some tension here and that's the difficulty we don't want to say no but we want to say yes in a way that doesn't hurt uh, newcomers such as and by the way we are a subscription based organization with no advertisement and I think that yes we can discuss the money com coming from platforms but we should be discussing also money coming from tabula and outbrain I think they're killing uh, uh, editorial quality and I think that organizations should be talking about that as well and not only about money coming from Google and Facebook so I think there are many layers there uh, how this can shape as I was saying how this can shape actually an industry that's good Can points. Observation? Yeah, sure. Quick well, observation. Just that it's always hard. I mean, it's a problem when you design policy. Is how do you design policy for people that aren't there? Clearly, policy design benefits incumbents, right? That's a basic problem, I would say. So, I'm not going to. As somebody who sits on the board of the Guardian, which is 200 years old, I would say there's also sometimes benefit in having a legacy industry <laughs> that will support and be there for the next 200 years. Um, sorry, I think I thought I saw a hand over there. Maybe I didn't. Um, it could just have been the light on the wall. Is that, yeah, but there is a hand over there. Yeah, nice and high. So, thanks. Sorry, I do apologize for saying things like nice and high. I'm used to talking to students in this room, so it's, it's, I do apologize. No worries. Hi, my name's Andrea Vega with the Center for International Media Assistance. We're a small research unit at the NED. So when we talk about media and the, re well, the, jur the relationship between journalism and big tech, uh, obviously the power falls with uh, big tech and the platform there is the ones that really have to, I mean, I guess the question is, how do we start these conversations, right? Independent media and civil society can only, we can do so much when the power falls on the platform. So beyond corporate social responsibility, what's the benefit for the platforms to want to pay for the news, right? To be involved in bargaining uh, code legislation. Um, I guess, what, what do we do <laughs> to, to get them to start these policy? That's a, that's a great question. I mean, just for my, my own two cents on that is actually reporting has been an amazingly powerful way of change, of moving the dial a tiny bit. So, so maybe that's kind of the, the power that we have. But I mean, that's, you know, back again to Christoph's point about how do you actually get into a negotiating um, position with these organizations? Uh, any thoughts and ideas for how we engage? I think I think legislation is what brings them to the table and the threat of legislation. And I see Anya's point, I mean, in, in the 40 or so African countries that we are uh, working in, of course, there are examples where the German network enforcement law was being adapted, copy-pasted, and they would say to the national parliaments, this is German, this is like the Mercedes of lawmaking, and now that law is being used to suppress critical bloggers and others. But would the alternative be to do no legislation? I don't think so. I think we need to encourage and support civil societies to, uh, to press those national governments to actually work on these national legislations and talking about the African continent. We need to encourage the African Union and the African Commission uh, to stand up to those networks, which is the biggest challenge, I think, because as I said earlier on, the relationship is very cozy of many African governments with uh, many of the network owners and given the good relationship of Af many African governments with the Chinese government, there's also a very cozy relationship with TikTok, by the way. I was actually, I was saying we haven't even mentioned the T word yet, which I did want to get to, which is, you know, for this feels like a two year out of date conversation because we haven't mentioned TikTok, which is now growing and faster and has a completely new demographic and has even less clarity, if you like, than, than Google and Facebook. Sorry, anyway, yes, Paula. But to go back to your question, I think, yes, regulation is essential. I think the business also, we need to think about the business. So YouTube was having trouble with advertisers that didn't want their advertisement on content that is not bad. I think it's in the best interest of Google, YouTube, to have quality content circulating. And I don't think there's intention there 
I, and that's why I think it's we should be treating platforms differently. And I and platforms you should be lo you shouldn't be lobbying together. I wouldn't if I were you. Uh, and um, I'm sounding super anti-platform and anti-legacy media. I think I, Google funded our racial diversity program in Brazil, and it was something. It was one of the sponsors, and it was something that it was a pioneer program in Brazil. Uh, this is a topic that is not addressed inside newsrooms, and we were able to do some something that was really important for the industry. So I think there's possibility of innovating with this kind of funds. And I think that legacy media is super important. I don't want to, I mean, it's how I fell in love with, I'm not a journalist, I, I have a PhD in social anthropology, but reading the newspaper every day is how I fell in love with journalism. So, but we need uh, legacy media to also think critically about themselves. And I don't think they're doing uh, the lesson well enough. So we're almost up to time, but we do have time for one more question, I think. Oh, and two more, in fact, um, I'm squeeze in two more. I'm Zafar Abbas, a journalist from Pakistan. Uh, about legislating th this kind of business, I think we will have to be very careful when we talk about legislation, in the, because in countries where there is an authoritarian rulers or people aspiring to be authoritarian, they can use such legislation or can design their own brand of legislation to, to their advantage and that is going, definitely going to go against media freedom. We'll have to be very careful when we talk about legislation. So I think that this is a, this is a point, and this comes up, obviously comes up a lot. I think maybe this comes back to the, not everything is gonna work in the same place. And it does seem to me that when you get authoritarian regimes, they're gonna do terrible things <laughs> to press freedom almost no matter what. So is, there, is it a case of it will work in some places, not in others? And, and what is the, is there a danger though that by having legislation, say in the United States, which I have to say seems quite unlikely, even though the G JCPA is once again kind of alive, is there a danger that that actually does then set a, an agenda that is, causes more trouble? Um, because it certainly seems as though having no legislation in the United States has caused certain amount of difficulty in other parts of the world where platforms are kind of, again, just not regulated at home. But Can I jump in for one second? Although I think I'm tempted we should get Courtney's question. Yeah. Um, but I just wanna say, like, I think the thing that we are all dancing around is the world has never seen corporations this large and this powerful. And we just don't know what to do, right? I mean, honestly, even if journalism was a legitimately large and robust industry, we would not be large enough to negotiate with them, which is why we turn to governments. But you are right. Governments are flawed also. And also, by the way, these companies shrug off billions and billions of dollars of fines from governments like as if it was nothing. So we're just in a weird situation as a world <laughs> where it's not clear, you know, we talk about too big to fail. I think these companies may be too big to control by anyone. Right. right. That's why I think regulations and edge. Two thoughts. One, first of all, fantastic. I used to go to Pakistan in the 1980s. Bad news um, is that Pakistan was always, you know, has been lousy to the media for decades. Ditto, I lived in Vietnam in the 90s. They were repressing media whether or not Germany has Nets DG. So, I think we're in a quandary because if Europe and Germany want to have laws, they can't not have laws because somebody somewhere might misuse them, especially countries that have been misusing laws forever. And I can't remember my second point, Courtney. Yep. <laughs> Thanks so I know much. what I want to say, which is we're also in the same problem because if we get Trump again, our laws are gonna be worthless as well. So right. it's not just between countries, it's temporality. So we're really in a pickle. Courtney. Thanks a lot. Uh, so my name's Courtney, obviously. Uh, the, yeah, so I just wrote a report for the Center for International Media Assistance about all of these different um, proposals to try to make big tech pay for the news they use. And what, you know, what it seems to me is we're fighting these battles, including with the J JCPA, which um, Julie and I were just discussing on a panel a couple days ago. The efforts to like allow news media to collectively bargain, are, aren't they going to be moot if the platforms decide, as Facebook has, to pivot away from news? And to some extent, 
these regulatory efforts, it seems to me we need to make the US and Europe responsible for the fact that their laws have implications far beyond their borders. And what can we do to get lawmakers in the US and Europe who have potentially some power to regulate the platforms to think about media in the so-called you know, global south who don't have a public. So that, thanks, Connie, and that seems to directly contradict aren't you, what you were saying, because you're saying you just have to pass the laws that suit your context and, in fact, don't think about elsewhere. I, you know, that feels intuitively, it feels, head says yes, heart says that can't be the, the right um, approach. I'm just sort of wondering, again, you say it's a quandary. Is there something, again, that we should be thinking about as, as journalists as well in terms of what we want the platforms to prior, you know, is there something beyond just regulation which says you need to be pro press freedom and you need to, you know, demonstrate those qualities? It's like David Kay's framework, which is a human rights framework, etc. Are there are there things that might go beyond laws that meet Courtney's yeah? Well, I feel like I'm hogging the mic, so I'll just quickly say, Courtney, nice idea, but I feel like reality of how policy is made. If we sit around and wait for the U.S to design the perfect law and nothing will ever happen. Nothing's happening anyway, so it's all theoretical. But absolutely, I mean, there are people in the room who know more than I do. There are international frameworks, treaties, and conventions on human rights, so clearly laws do need to comport with the anything anybody signed, right? Any other? Sorry, don't, everyone's like, no, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> so, so we're actually up to time. Um, in fact, we just one minute over time. I want to thank the panel. That was a great discussion uh, and actually fantastic <laughs> questions as well. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks.